Good afternoon, everybody. It is so good to see all of you here. Thank you so much for coming. If you look at the title of today's Dharma talk, it's quite unusual because we talk about shocks. Usually, when we share the Dharma and speak about the Buddha's teaching, we talk about quiet, balanced, peaceful mind, because that's what we want. But that's exactly what we don't get most of the time. So we should start with what we actually have. And most of the time, we are exposed to shocks, whether it's small shock or big shock. And what we, we may not realize, that this desire for life comes together with the desire for the shocks themselves. And in our minds, we really wish to be as quiet and as peaceful and as balanced as possible. But if you look at the way we are built, the way we took this body, the way we nurture and manufacture our minds, various forms of consciousness, we are not made for peaceful living by default. We can only attain that after some practice. We chanted Jong Jin Ha Se, Jong Jin Se. We, we, we strive and practice, and then we can attain that. But look at the way our body and mind connect. You look at the various energy centers in the body and in the mind. We have thinking here, we have speech here, we have emotions here, we have our not moving mind, our tanjon near our belly button. Lower than that, we make more kids and then the world becomes you know, full of human beings. All our bodies are made for movements and touch and sensory perceptions and the mind uses that. Now, what is a shock? Shock is something so strong that you don't want, you know? We really love to be connected to the internet, but when something just hits you through the screen, you can call it a shock, a picture you don't want, some kind of sight or smell in the outside world that kind of gets you out of your ordinary mind. But if you look at these centers, every single thought is a disturbance of your not moving mind. Every single feeling is a disturbance of your super quiet not moving mind. And how long could we bear that actually, that we don't have these normal inputs of thoughts and feelings and eyes and ears. In, in other words, how long could we tolerate not being a sentient being? And I can tell you, very, very little, very, very short time. Um, in America, when they started this New Age movement, they had much, much kind of confusion what kind of path a human being should follow towards awakening. And one device that they tried was the flotation tank experiment. Imagine a huge tank full of salty water, very, very salty water, totally body temperature, and you are put into a space suit which has oxygen, uh, which has even a little sip of water if you need, uh, but you cannot see anything, cannot hear anything, cannot feel anything. So all the six senses, they're blotted out by the darkness and evenness of the flotation tank as an environment. Totally dark, totally unmoving. You can move, but you don't feel your body's uh, borders because the temperature doesn't change. And you can feel the, the clothing, this kind of spacesuit type of thing for a while, but the sensation of your body soon disappears. Uh, it was very rare that people could tolerate this more than 10 hours. Some people went downright crazy. So if you take the Heart Sutra literally, no eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no realm of eyes, no realm of any kind of consciousness, in other words, totally shock-free environment, most people cannot tolerate that and they would go crazy, or they would do something stupid, or their own mental projections would create uh, terrible illusions. A sentient being comes out of thirst, the Buddha said. This thirst in Sanskrit, tanha, is the root of our birth. 
this thirst for sensation, thirst for being born. And that is the root for our desire to be shocked or entertained or just kept busy throughout our senses. Now, if we do not acknowledge that, we cannot have a correct shock therapy treatment. Because it is true that if we want to attain something which is stronger than shock, we have to attain no shock. We have to attain the mind that doesn't move. We have to attain the mind that doesn't depend on the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, thinking mind. And that's where our suhan comes in. Except that maybe most of you haven't looked at it from this point of view, that actually suhang or meditation practice can be a shock treatment. But it is. Let me explain why. Like I said, we are attached to our senses. We depend on our sensory inputs. So we want to be shocked. We want to be satisfied by some sudden big happiness. And that's the kind of mind that most people you know, have when they practice enlightenment. When they want enlightenment, it's like a special kind of satisfaction. It's a special kind of very happy awakening experience. And if they practice long enough, they will learn that this is not true. If people are attached to the positive shock of enlightenment, they become obsessed. And they become just as dependent and addicted like to some kind of drug. And maybe in the Orient, due to the long-term tradition, here 1,700 years, elsewhere maybe even longer, uh, this kind of notion disappeared, maybe. But in the West, the positive shock of the Enlightenment experience is a huge motivating factor for people to practice. And you may say, yeah, it's selfish. But at the beginning, when the notion of the self is so strong, then the notion of reward should be just as strong for most people who do not have the bodhisattva motivation yet. How would they? How would they? They only have an ego which has a problem. Either too many shocks or not enough shocks. Or only negative shocks and not positive shocks. We are totally thrilled when kids are conceived and born, you know? People congratulate one another. Oh, wow, she's pregnant. Wonderful. Nine months later or so, she gave birth. Boy or girl. Wonderful. So these are the shocks that we actually want, mostly, as normal human beings. And when somebody dies, the diametric opposite happens. Oh, he or she is no longer with us, passed away. So then we are deeply shocked that this is happening. So if we attain the mind which is beyond life and death, doesn't depend on life and death, we can actually become stronger than these shocks that we experience. So there's a saying, if it doesn't kill you, it will make you stronger. So with shocks, it's exactly like that. All of you in this room experienced shocks in your life. Sudden changes, unwanted events. Very wonderful people departing and disappearing from your life. And sometimes really ugly ones for you coming in. So what can you do when these shocks appear? First of all, you should see why we need them. I've briefly talked about it. We are sentient beings, we have body and mind together, and our mind is thirsty for input. That thirst generates the need for these positive shocks. And with the positive comes the negative. If you have positive, huge events, then you have very big negative events, just like that. So, instead of trying to avoid them, because obviously we cannot, let's see how we can deal with them. So first of all, when the Buddha was teaching the Four Noble Truths, he said, first recognize the fact of suffering. So the fact of suffering is just the way we exist. You don't have to be tortured. You don't have to be deprived. You don't have to sink. You don't have to go through any tragedy. Suffering is part of every single human being's life. And if you notice, moment to moment, because if it's not your suffering, it's somebody else's suffering right next to you. So if you notice, the fact of suffering is essential to see the cause of suffering. The cause we also talked about is the very reason why we want to be born. It's not just your attachments, not just your dependencies. It's way before that. It's the thirst for experience, for individualized life, to have a notion called I, so that 
there would be an ego. There would be something I can call myself and distinguish from the rest of the world. These are very basic human drivers. But if you notice, the main three human activities on this earth, survival, possession, and procreation, they are driven by these mental factors. So it's very strong. So that's why people give birth, because we want to procreate. That's why we acquire things, because we want to possess. And when it comes to a very tough situation, most of us would be ready to kill. That's why we still have wars. And don't think you cannot. There can be conditions in a nanosecond that can change you or break you. So that's when we need to be prepared for shocks so that these shocks wouldn't condition us, but we could use them for something. Because ironically, if you turn this equation around and ask, how do we make these shocks happen? If we asked for it, how would we do it? Then you get closer to the actual truth, how we live and die, and what you can do with life in this body. So if you wanted to shock yourself, what would you do? First of all, you have a normal range of speech and thinking and emotions. And if you have too much, like somebody shouts at you, then it's too much. Then you got too much speech and too much hearing power. Or if somebody puts light right before your eyes, a blinding bright light, and it shocks your eyes. Or if somebody burns your skin, and that's a burning shock. Okay. So how do we determine which one we like and which one we don't, okay? Like somebody opens a case before you with a million dollars. That's a huge shock because you used to have like, what, Ibekmanon, Sambekmanon per month. And that's a good month when you have Sambekmanon in your pocket. But you're not used to Ilok, okay? So that's a shock. It's a positive shock. And most people say, oh, please give that to me. But along with that comes something that you don't like. So how do we distinguish between what we like as a shock and what we don't like as a shock? Again, you look at the three major human drivers, survival, possession, and procreation, and whatever serves these three, that's a positive shock. And whatever eliminates these three or damages these three, that's a negative shock. Look at that. Now, if you want to go beyond that, we have to attain a mind which does not depend on life and death. And for lack of a better word, we call that emptiness, or in another way, in Sung San Sunim's teaching, we call it don't know, no thinking mind. So imagine an environment where shock cannot accumulate, where shock waves cannot be formed. Why? You need a mind, you need a surface, you need a personality, an I, my, me, so that there would be somebody to shock. But if there's empty space, empty space cannot be shocked. So if you do not identify with the body, if you do not identify with your mind, then these shocks very quickly appear and disappear without you touching them, getting involved in them. So you can go through them much faster and with much less damage than otherwise. How can you notice that you're making a mistake? When your chilshik, your seventh consciousness, makes judgments, that's where your good and bad notions begin. So if you see that your judgmental mind is very strong, then you are in for a rough ride, because the stronger your seventh consciousness is, the bigger your judgments are, then the bigger this roller coaster of positive shock, negative shock, positive shock, negative shock is. The other factor is your pajshik, the eighth consciousness. That's where your memories are. All your lifetimes, everything you identified with and you didn't unload, that's in your eighth consciousness. So the more content you have and the more comes to the surface, the stronger your seventh consciousness functions because you always have to see in your memory, I use this, I don't use this. I identify with this, I don't identify with this. I like this, I don't like this. 
So the more content comes from the eighth, the busier the seventh is. And how do you make that conscious for yourself? With the sixth, you make concepts. You have conceptual thinking, analytic thinking, logical thinking, and then your sixth consciousness is also busy. How can you notice this in everyday life? Well, ride the subway. Everybody's in their little electronic device using these three consciousnesses and totally forgetting their environment. So when somebody says from behind, Chilamnida, okay. Because they were not there in the moment. Instead, they were using their six, seven, and eight to write a cacao talk message. It's very innocent. But no matter how innocent it may seem, it takes you away from the moment. Okay? So having a good shock absorber is absolutely dependent on you being present, being in this moment. If this moment is clear, your relationship to your karma is also very clear. If you take away your presence and you take a ride in your 6, 7, and 8 consciousness, then you're not here. You're barely in your body. And something hits you, something shocks you, whether physically or mentally, then you wake up. And that shock itself is bigger sometimes than the event. Somebody says, Shilla Hamnida, that's nothing. But when you are kind of blasted out of your dream that you're only dealing with your friend, lover, partner, whatever, and reality somehow torpedoes that, that's a bigger shock, much bigger than the actual event that triggered it. So your karma is the biggest shock attractor, and your true self, your true nature, is the biggest shock absorber. You have both. So it, it's your job to decide what kind of magnet you want to be. What do you want to attract? You depend on your karma, then whatever your karma contains, the relevant attraction appears in people, events, things, whatever. If you're not attached, then anything that happens in this moment can serve your awakening instead of just shocking you. So if you're standing on the platform on a railway station and suddenly an engine honks its horn, suddenly, whoo! If you're there, you're not shocked. If your mind and body are separated and your mind is attached to something, you're shocked. So if you wanted to ask for being shocked, then the sentence would be, give me a ride so that I would lose the moment. If you want to lose the moment, you will. If you lose the moment, that's the root for being shocked because the awakening experience, the sudden impact, that brings body and mind together again. And in fact, that's how Zen works. If you remember the original teaching by the Tang Dynasty Zen Master, when they asked Zen Master Lin Chi what is Buddha, he just shouted, oh! Then people wake up. So this kind of shock is actually a possible tool for awakening. If it's overdone, it's no good. If it's underdone, too quiet, too peaceful, also no good. Guji Zen Master, when they asked him what is Buddha, he just picked up one finger. Or Dong San Zen Master, when they asked him what is true nature, he just hit people with his big stick. So if you look at this and the current shocks that we receive from movies, from the TV news, in fact, we open the TV just to be shocked in the right way. Okay? Shocks can lead you to many places. The question is, why do you make them? Why do you tolerate them? Why do you receive them? And if that direction is clear, then uh, shocks stop to being so bad. In fact, some people can get used to it. So much that they want bigger shocks and bigger shocks and bigger shocks. And um, if you look at current society, everything tries to be safe and shockproof and insulated and uh, somehow take out the unexpected, whether it's financial, political, personal, social. And that's when people become desensitized. You lose your sensitivity because everything tastes the same. 
You open the television, everything sounds and looks the same. Everything becomes this kind of average stream of consciousness. And when something really big happens, you lose your tolerance. You are easily shocked by things that used to be totally normal. And you don't respond to things that used to shock you. 150 years ago, when we lived more or less in smaller cities than Suwon, okay? 150 years ago, very few cities in the world had more than like 2-3 million people. Only very, very developed uh, capital cities of the world had more than that. If one person died in a neighborhood, it was a big shock. The loss was imminent and evident, not just for the family, but also for the community. And everybody was totally upset and wanted to find out if somebody died, how that happened. If it was an irregular death, especially. Now, you open the television, in 10 minutes, just in the news, you can see hundreds of people dying a virtual death on the screen. And you have this every single day, wherever, whether it's Africa, Russia, Ukraine, South America, or a school in Oregon. It doesn't matter, but you lose your sensitivity because you experience it virtually, but you don't experience it in the flesh as a neighborhood event. So when it happens in the neighborhood, you lose your sensitivity because it seems the same as the television event. So these big inputs or big shocks, they are neither good nor bad. The question is, can we handle them? And like I began, you know, this discourse, if we return to the mind first, which is free from any shock and totally present in the moment, that is the foundation for endurance. If we cannot return to that, and if we always keep moving, always keep thinking, attached to thoughts and feelings and notions of past, present, or future, then we cannot absorb the shock and we reverberate it, react to it, and our reaction makes it worse. Okay? Adds to it. So, clear like space, clear like a mirror, in this case, means not reacting. You do not react to it. <coughs> So you do not make it bigger. You react to it, you make it bigger. Um, in the Buddha's time, there was a very important lay teacher, Yumagosa or Vimalakirti. And he had a concept. It's called the patient endurance of the uncreated. Now, the uncreated, we all know from our studies what that is, or well, the most people would want the teacher to talk about, what is the uncreated? Well, we cannot really talk about that because we don't know what that is. In fact, that is the don't know that we cannot explain. That is the mind which we can bounce around and circumambulate for a thousand years, but verbally you cannot express that. True nature, Buddha nature, enlightenment nature, you name it but no name can even come close to the actual experience. However, when we talk about patient endurance, that's something that we need to clarify what that is. First of all, it's not laziness. It's not being insensitive. It's not a kind of uh, uh, catatonic state in a stupor when <laughs> we just exist like a piece of rock and nothing else happens. This endurance, Yorobun, this endurance is keeping this moment clear and your mind sensitive and strong at the same time. Now, that's the task. Sensitive and strong at the same time. Imagine shock absorbers that would be so fine and so little that even you put one gram on it, the meter would balance. And even if you drop 10 tons on it, it wouldn't break. Such absorbers, such scales in the physical world usually don't exist. But your mind can do it. So that you would be totally sensitive to the emotions of your own child, even if it's just one shred of sadness, frustration, disappointment. Mothers have that most of the time, hopefully fathers too. And when something really strong comes and threatens the family, then a strong emotional and if necessary physical response protects the family. Now, that's the huge shock that appears. So, 
most of the time we are either capable of one, the very big, and we are not able the, to respond to the very small because we either notice this or have power for the other. But your mind is capable of both. So when you practice this clear mind and enjoy your karma, you keep reflecting your karma. You stay in the moment and not attached to anything that appears in your mind and just keep reflecting, reflecting, reflecting. That endurance makes you strong. That's why meditation has side effects, very positive side effects for those who practice it. So if we are not attached to the sweet prospect of uh, sudden and pleasurable enlightenment, we can actually get something done. And that is patient endurance of the uncreated. You always return to the mind which is before thinking. You always disengage and uh, disconnect from anything that you might be attached to or identified with. And when you do that, you become stronger. This mental stamina that we can pay attention for longer than five minutes, that we can be present in this room for one hour and a half, that our minds can connect and interact, that takes a huge amount of effort to be correctly focused but not too tight and to be totally open but not kind of being disintegrated. Now, this takes a lot of effort and practice. And our practice is really about uh, clarifying the mind and not seeking for any special experience. Having this patient endurance of the uncreated as well as the endurance of our karma so that we could prepare for the shocks and if they happen then we would gain some correct awakening by them and not be crushed by them. Like I've said, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. But how do you prepare? How do you become strong enough for the unexpected? for something that you cannot foresee. And that's when we say build up your potential. And that's why practice will never make you perfect, but practice will give you things that otherwise would not be accessible for you. And these are things in your mind that you already have, potentially. So this is clarity, non-attachment, uh, like a mirror, reflective function, endurance in a way that anything that falls onto the mirror doesn't break the mirror, doesn't even dent the mirror. If you don't follow your judgments, your mirror remains straight and clear and smooth. If you follow your judgments, your mirror becomes like a wave. And if you hit the wave at the right spot, the whole thing can break. Okay? So all it takes is actually very little conceptual study and a lot of practicing. So I have the privilege and the honor to speak before you like once or twice a year, usually twice. And we spend about an hour and a half together with questions and answers and a short Dharma talk prior. But in fact, that's not what we should be doing. We should be sitting together maybe for a few hours and have like 20, 30 minutes of talking before or after. Then the proportions would be better. Current habits, the way we are, permit for the Dharma talks because that's what you're interested in. And if you were told that we would meditate for, for two hours in silence, it would say, ah, Jemiopta, not interesting. I have other business to do. I have phone calls to make, I have people to talk to, I have purchases to make, etc., etc. You're a boy. Don't delude yourself. If we practice this not moving, clear mind, then we have this endurance and stamina that can withstand the shock of life and death and living a sentient life on this planet. If we don't develop that mind, if we don't use our potential, we will be broken. And nobody should be. Okay? So, I think this is plenty for introductory. And if you could kindly look into your mind and ask any questions that you may have, any kind. My Dharma name is Chirim. And, uh, good to see you. Uh, I'm not good at speaking English very well. So, good <laughs> uh, uh, you mean if I concentrate on 
here and now. And uh, uh, 그러면 샤크가 uh, 이렇게 돌 저희가 돌 샤크 한다는 말인가요? In English, please. <laughs> International Dharma Instructors Association. <laughs> That's why I'm pushing you. If I concentrate on here and now, uh, then a uh, shock of death of life, death or life, uh, reduce Can, cannot break you. It's not reduced. Uh, you can't reduce a truck, but you can choose to stand in front or stand on the side. Depends on you. You can't reduce the KTX. The KTX is that long and that fast. But whether you are standing on the tracks or on the platform, that's your choice. Very important. You, you, you can't mitigate life. Life is as it is. You can't have smaller deaths than others. Every death is the same death. Okay? So be absolutely clear and clear like space. Clear like a mirror means not attached to anything. And that reflective power gives you space. And in that space, many things can happen. But it doesn't take you. It doesn't grab you. It doesn't get you in, okay? So then the samsaric consciousness doesn't appear. No confusion, okay? You're welcome. More questions? Well, uh, we seem to live in an age of a shock, collectively. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Korean people nowadays feel helplessness. Yeah. Very uh, guilty feeling we, f we, we share yeah. after the Sewol Ho accident. And uh, uh, we have witnessed the incapabilities of government yeah. or authoritative bodies uh, which have very limited coping capacities. So uh, our environment nowadays is very shocking. Uh, every day I sh feel shock. Uh, tomorrow I, I may feel shock too. Okay. So, in this kind of collective shock, uh, how can we cope? How can we act? Very good question. First of all, I have to tell you uh, how deeply shocked I am at the Sewolho Ferry disaster. Korea is not a third world country. Korea is a highly civilized, developed, vibrant society with many traditions, many social traditions, to form a high-class culture and a wonderful civilized life here. And yet we experienced what we experienced. There are questions that are begging for answer and the trial in Gwangju just began last Tuesday. So I'm wondering whether those real questions will be asked and the shocks would be relieved. So first of all, by your very healthy and clear consciousness, perceive it. That perception, that seeing gives you space. So that kind of perception is seeing clearly is the first sign that you can deal with it. So you're not repressing anything. You're not inviting something quick fix medicine, quick happiness right away. That is compensation. And this compensation also distorts the view. So when you look at that, any kind of event, whether it's the ferry disaster or any other shock in your life, this perception gives you your situation as well. So you are sitting in Myeongdong in your armchair, and south of Korea, in the ferry, people are dying in the sea. So your situation, their situation become absolutely clear. Then comes your relationship with it. You're Korean, they are Koreans. You feel responsible. They are your kinsmen. For other human beings who are not Korean, it's, it's, it's the same thing, but a little bit more remote, not through ethnicity and language and common social tradition, but yet other humans, and we feel terribly sorry that this is happening. Relationship, once you notice that, then comes function. So your job 
is maybe to donate Imanon towards the relief fund or send something to the right place that can help the victims or the victims' families. But it's not your job to be the Coast Guard because you're not. It's not your job to be the rescue diver because you're not. So once you establish your situation, relationship, and function, you converted the shock to energy. Yorabun, this is supremely important. Shock has a huge amount of energy. And if you cannot deal with it, it acts like a nuclear bomb in your life. It blows you apart. It gives you contaminated consciousness for a long time. Now, if you use your awareness very clearly, if you use your mind correctly, you convert the nuclear bomb to a nuclear power plant. Big difference. Nuclear power plant, if it functions well, and there's no tsunami, no meltdown, then that nuclear power plant can give you energy for a long time. Very, very long time. So the real question is, how do you convert the shock into energy, the deprivation to motivation? We can do that, but only if our minds are open enough and not attached and non-judgmental and not divided to past, present, and future. And when we do that, we can only be destroyed but never defeated. Okay? So what can you do? It depends on your situation, relationship, and function. Don't be helpless. Nobody is helpless. Okay? If you see these three things clearly, you also see what you can and cannot do. And as a citizen, you are absolutely right about demanding to know. That's a huge way of processing it. I demand to know answers why. Tak, 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 tak. We have at least five, six major headlines that were never answered so far. Okay? I don't want to go into the details. You already know that. There are so many controversies, so many question marks about this terrible disaster that if they don't get answered, then Korean people have the absolute right to demand to know. And demand as long as necessary to have clarification so that these incidents would never appear again. So convert the shock into energy, convert the nuclear bomb into a nuclear power plant. And if you cultivate your mind, you can do that. Okay? You're welcome. My name is Song Nim. Many monks say the purpose of <clears throat> practice is managing the karma. Have you experienced the managing the karma in your mind in practicing state? I'm sorry, I didn't understand your English. What you said, <laughs> yes. what you said before karma, what yeah, was yes. that? Okay, many monks say the, uh, uh, the purpose of practice is to banish the karma in mind. Banish the karma? Banish, banish. Banish. banish yes. You mean send away? Yes, yes, send away. Send away the karma in mind. Have okay. we, yes, have we experienced the, the such statement? Of course I mind? did, but it always came back. So after a while, I stopped sending it away. Because... Karma is like your dog. You bought the dog, you tamed the dog, you wanted the dog, you fed the dog, you loved the dog, and when you hate the dog, you want to send it away, the dog will come back anyway. Okay? So banishing karma is the first act. In fact, it's a child's act of denial. So first of all, don't want to banish your karma because it comes back with a vengeance. That's why repression doesn't work. Perception works, suppression doesn't work. So what you need to do is, don't banish your karma. I understand you want that to go away. So if you want your dog to take a walk, you throw a very nice and big bone as far as possible, and the dog runs after it. And that's a different story, okay? Or you sell your dog to an other owner if you are really tired of it. I know it sounds cruel, but let's be fair. You don't put the dog on the street. You definitely don't put the dog to sleep if he or she is healthy. But you find another owner. So how do you do that in everyday life? You have a karma that haunts you, that always comes back. It's in your mind. It's like a worm in the wood, always, always gnawing at you, biting you, eating you. 
and it takes your energy, takes your resolve, makes you depressed, what do you do? What do you do? First of all, don't run. Usually we say banish karma, but we run. We want to escape, so we banish ourselves. So don't do that. Stay in the moment, stay absolutely unmoving, not moving mind, clear like space, clear like a mirror. That meant you turned around from running and started to see. Then you see how that karma is made, how you feed your dog, how you have your dog, you know, function, how you train your dog. And then you simply stop making that karma. You stop feeding the dog, okay? And take it as a metaphor. Don't do that to your actual dog. Do that to your karma that you don't feed it. And you see that if you unmake your karma in reverse order compared to how you made it, then it disappears because you made it. So you have your own car and that car starts to run towards you for some reason down on a slope. You can't stop it. If you stand before it, it's going to crush you. Somehow you have to run, get into the driver's seat, turn on the engine and stop the car with the pedals. So that's how cars are driven. If you understand how cars are driven, you can stop it. If you understand how karmas are made, you can unmake it. And for that, you have to see it. You have to perceive that. And most of your unfinished or unseen karma shocks you. That's why there is this knock at your door. Deal with me. Deal with me. It's me. It's my person. It's my karma. So how do you start? You start, like I said, building some space, building some distance, having some perception, starting to function like a mirror instead of a raging sea. Because when the water is totally and absolutely quiet, that point is clear perception. When you disturb the water with your memories, your judgments, your ideas, then it becomes like the raging sea. But it's just water. It can function in this way and in that way. It's your choice. Okay? That's why in the old days, uh, the master said, whether awake or in a dream, sitting, standing, lying down, walking, talking, or in silence, constantly, without interruption. What is this? Keep the huadu, keep the question. What is this? Now, if you do that, then this what is this question gives you exactly what I talked about. It gives you distance, it gives you perception, it gives you non-identification, it gives you non-attachment, all that. And in that space, with that perception, you can see how you make your karma. So don't banish it, dismantle it. Take the energy out, take the information out, nothing remains. For that, you have to be brave. Everybody has to be brave enough to face their own thing inside, which we mostly don't want to see. We don't want to see our own homework. We don't want to know who we truly are, but we are attached to what we think we are. And that's why we suffer and make others suffer just as well. Now, the good news is it doesn't have to be that way. And the even better news is that you can do this. You can walk on the path, okay? So usually we say, I have bad news and good news. Not in this case. I have good news and even better news, okay? So, return to the mind which doesn't know. Focus on your tanjan. Keep your question. And your karma will become your tamed dog. And if necessary, you can make it disappear completely. It's up to you. Just don't run, don't escape, don't banish, don't judge, and everything's going to be fine. More questions? Uh, my name is uh, Teng Wang. Uh, mm, uh, yesterday, uh, I am importing some food material for, from um, US to and distribute to my customers in Korea. So yesterday, I imported some material but uh, it's uh, past the, the customs. But uh, I, when, 
when I delivered this to the material to my customer, it was uh, it takes I found some problems and I they claimed a lot a problem. So I was so at that time it was uh, not kind of mine. It's uh, the uh, it's uh, the problem of the exporters. So I was so angry with that. I phoned to my uh, the U.S. So the supplier. Yeah, yes. So I maybe I talk with him one more than hours. It's, it's kind of a shock. So I cannot endure uh, at that time. So when I hear your uh, speech. Uh, how how I should do at that time? Very good. First of all, you should see that it's your wanting mind that shocks you because you want to sell but you cannot because the delivery is damaged. It is very honest business that you're doing that you get it from the US and you want to distribute it to your Korean customers. Great. There's nothing wrong with that. But your routine, the usual range of actions and thoughts and emotions are within the normal limits of operation. That means you order it, they manufacture it, they supply it, it's shipped, you receive it, customs, distribution, your customers pay, you get it on your bank account and the whole thing starts again. That's the no normal cycle. The abnormal cycle is when you open the crate, open the box and something's rotten there, totally. And you're shocked. You say, I want to sell this, but I cannot. That's the shock. So the rotten vegetable doesn't have a shocked consciousness. We do. Because we cannot sell it. So that moment, you have to give up the idea of selling it right away. Because you can't. Obviously, you cannot. So see the situation for what it is. This piece of vegetable in this way is not tradable. Done. You can't sell it. And when you come to terms with it, then you convert your shocked energy into investigation. But if you are shocking yourself all the time in your mind, I want to sell it, but I cannot. I'm losing money. I, I, I. Then shock appears and reappears and you make yourself weak. Don't do that because you need energy to talk to your supplier. So first of all, realize the fact as it is that this market is very demanding and that vegetable is not tradable finished and once you realize that you get strength in truth there's strength in ideas there's weakness so when you when you did that then you can realize your situation is that you are part of this food chain your relationship is that you're responsible for your customers and your supplier is, is responsible for you your function is to launch immediately an investigation what happened and use every means necessary to ascertain what happened, get the damages compensated and get the order done. Now, if you keep shocking yourself, oh, it's bad luck, it's my bad karma, don't do that. It's superstition. Look at cause and effect as they are. So that's how you can convert shock into solution. Okay? Very good question. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Any more practical and wonderful questions, Yorobun? Right here. Uh, the, uh, some Christian sect, mm. uh, which uh, reveals lots of some difficulties and, and problems. And in case that the, uh, I encounter a person who are deeply involved and the, uh, maybe uh, addicted to the kind of uh, creed, then how can I uh, start the uh, conversation or some opening the minds or something? You should start with the most important sentence that these people should hear. Jesus loves you. <laughs> That's how you should start. Everything else is up to the person's openness, how much he wants to listen to you. People in these kinds of situations, they're extremely attached to their ideas. So strong that unless they begin to suffer, they have no questions. They have no interest in changing their minds. So find some 
common views or common spots or mutual interests where you can talk some sense. Like, suppose that person is your business partner, then you have to talk about business and not about his creed and beliefs. Most people are super defensive about what they believe and who they think they are. You cannot breach that and you shouldn't. Their own suffering will. So be there, especially if you can build up some friendly relationship if the person is a long-term company in your life, whether it's business or school or alumni, whatever it is. So having a non-judgmental mind about these people is supremely important. Tolerating their views and not attaching to them is number three. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this is just human that you are ready to help if the person is ready to receive it. But before that, why would you bang your head on a stone wall? Why would you want to open a door which is locked from the inside and the person doesn't want to let you in? So be patient, be ready, and relate to the person through some normal human channel which doesn't bring out the edginess of this monotheistic strong view. And if it's not necessary, then don't talk. Talking makes it difficult. Acting together, if necessary, that's much better. You're welcome. In order not to lose this valuable opportunity, uh, well, again, nowadays we are shocked again to see our president who nominated our prime minister. And the nominee uh, is a very conservative, uh, fundamentalist Christian. Mm -hmm. Uh, who has very uh, uh, unusual view, historical view. Uh, so he upset me as well as um, uh, my family and many other people. Uh, we, s we don't see this is uh, justice because the Christians... Uh, formed the front line to support him these days. Mm -hmm. So the Christian groups and the ruling party uh, is ready to support him while opposing party, uh, I, mean, I mean opposite party, uh, oppose him. So we people feel un uneasy and uh, 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 are worried very much about our future. So how, what we Buddhists can do in this situation? Practice. <laughs> <laughs> don't stop there. Number one is practice. You don't process this, it will keep bugging you. And you can't sleep then, and you can't do your job, and you can't you know, even talk straight to your husband and daughters and whatnot. But, Practice is number one, is, and it's just the foundation. Then again, just like with your previous question, you see your own situation. You are Korean, living in Korea, this thing concerns you. It worries you. Relationship is you're not the only one. There are other Koreans who are genuinely and truthfully concerned. So, Korea is a group-based society. And... I'm very skeptical about political parties because political parties are rigged with hidden interests. Build communities where people genuinely trust each other and not just use each other. That's really important. And when you have that, then you have a trust-based awareness community. And this is really important. And then you can actually uh, have a very, very strong social movement, which is non-political, politically non-aligned, just presenting facts and asking for truth. This is the most dangerous thing. Because if you become political, you can be manipulated in a nanosecond by the whole election process and the financial and military situation within the country. And uh, that's when you, we can see the absolute bankruptcy of the current political systems wherever you go. Because it seems that it works, for the people, by the people, etc. But in fact, it serves the interests of the few from behind. And you don't have to be a conspiracy theorist for that. You can see it happening. You can see it in the decisions of the quote-unquote politicians whom we elected in our countries. 
these civil NGO-based awareness groups presenting facts and asking for facts. This is really important. So ally yourself, create groups and create communities and be active. Because if it doesn't happen on the outside, only on the inside, you feel something's lacking and somebody told you just to go to Nirvana. We didn't say that. Anybody with some sense of responsibility sees that the laws are the same on the inside and on the outside. If you see the truth inside, you can demand the truth outside as well. It follows the same rules. So then, associate with people you trust, present facts that you have reason to believe in, and ask for facts that you feel you have the right to know. And this can start many, many things. And only go to the extent when you do not force yourself into unwarranted compromises. In other words, do not melt your own backbone. You can bow, but don't break. So don't let your integrity disappear for the greater good. That's how disasters begin. I've seen that so many times in Europe. In the last 100 years, we had oodles of that and tens of millions of people died just because some people lost their integrity. Uh, my question is, uh, again, the, uh, regarding the Christian, Christian sect. Mm -hmm. Now on the news spotlight, and then I don't think that is uh, the only Christian sect in Korea, uh, which is uh, rather, which are rather kind of some um, not the, uh, away from mainstream and then uh, rather kind of uh, strange, mm -hmm. uh, pathetic maybe. And then the, uh, but the, uh, we became to know how the uh, those sect people in the sect, how those people in the sects behavior and then uh, how they uh, uh, adhere each other and then to the, uh, the uh, sport they create or something like that. And overall, the, I feel that the, uh, the people in Christian the belief is uh, more kind of strict than people in Buddhism in Korea. Yeah. So how do you foresee uh, the, the, uh, the prospect of the, uh, the, these religions, Buddhism, Christianity in Korea, from the, uh, the lessons in the, uh, this uh, tragedy? Um, whatever is tight and strict will break itself. Whatever is open and flexible will sustain itself. I didn't say this. Your beautiful Taoist tradition does. And how to relate to them, just from your current point of view. Remind them of those parts of the Bible that they chose to ignore. That's most of the New Testament. And they abide to the Old Testament mostly. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and having these huge examples of God wills it type of causality. Because it's all God's will, they have the authority to do these things. Well, uh, the jury is still out who and what God is, and there's even more of a debate what his or her divine will could be. So the next step is to really uh, look at those passages in the Bible and publicly hold them accountable for the love of your neighbor, for the compassion and loving kindness that Jesus Christ was teaching, and um, all the good things that are in there but it's not manifesting through the actions and speech of these folks. When you use their own teaching to wake them up, it will be way, way better. If you present yourself as a Buddhist, it's already a big divide between them and you. Don't do that. Be a very sincere Buddhist, but adapt to circumstances. So if they, if they do all these things and say all these things and they are as intolerant as they are, so where are they from the true teaching of Jesus Christ? So you have to get to know them deeper than they, do, than they know themselves. You have to understand their teaching better than they understand their own teaching themselves. And if you do that, you not only criticize them, but you only do a great service to them to wake up to the actual wrongs that they are doing with their own tools. You cannot use your own tools. 
You cannot talk about enlightenment, wisdom, and compassion from the Buddhist point of view because they reject it from 10 miles away. You cannot. We should see that our human nature is very much the same, but our karma is very, very different. And uh, when you truly build some tolerance based on your compassion, then the manifestation of that must be based on this kind of adaptive wisdom that I'm trying to impart, not just on you, but on everybody. To use their own tools, understand their own teaching, really see their problems and talk to that problem to alleviate that, to help their suffering. These people deep inside are suffering very, very greatly, but they cover it up with many layers of delusion. And the more fanatical they are, the thicker the illusions are. Okay? So if you really see that suffering spot, in fact, just one of the many suffering spots in such consciousness, and you heal that with your own loving kindness, that person will stop hating you. But if you alienate them, if you judge them, if you are the Buddhist and they are the Christian, there's war. When I, when I watched your Dharma talk on Buddhism television network, um, I heard that I heard that um, your story about the Sungsan masters. So um, that was um, you asked uh, a question to Sungsan master, uh, which was uh, can thinking be an action? No, 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 no. What is me? It, that's what I asked, I remember. Uh, yeah. Okay. What, what, what is the meaning of life? So... I didn't ask him that, but that's okay, just go ahead. <laughs> that was my first question to him 23 years ago, 1991 April, in the huge university auditorium was, he was always thinking, don't think, just do it, you know him. Cut off your thinking, only do it. So then I wanted to catch him and said, Sir, can thinking be an action? <laughs> you know, he says, there are five kinds of thinking, attachment thinking, intellectual thinking, no thinking, freedom thinking, clear thinking, which one do you like? <laughs> now that was a shock, <laughs> you know. So next day, uh, there was meditation workshop, and I read a little bit some of his books, not everything. And um, I asked him a question about theater and acting and uh, personality. And uh, he asked me back, uh, directly pointing that if you're not attached to any roles that you play, then who are you? And then I shouted, ha! Then he said, only that. So that's how he reflected it back and our standard Dharma combat style. And I blushed, my face became red. I couldn't say anything. And I totally lost my narrative. And then he smiled at me, just like most of you right now. And he says, you understand one, don't understand two, I will hit you 30 times, okay. you know? So these were these interactions. And if something else is quoted in the, the broadcast, that is possible. I asked him later many questions. But for the record, for the accuracy of my fledgling history with him, these were the first two interactions that actually sealed my allegiance to him because his teaching, his energy, his mind actually healed me when I was very wounded. So that was, that was really important. Now, please, let's get back to the question. Uh, yeah, you already answered my question. Because, did I? Uh, How yeah. did I do that? Because my question, my intended question is, is like that. Um, so you asked, Sungsan Master, what is the meaning of life? And then Sungsan Master answered to you that um, there is no meaning of, in life. There is no meaning of life. So when I watched television program, yeah. 50%. You should remember the next sentence as well. It was not my question to him, but he answered this in this way for many people. And I heard it, and I was there to witness it. Uh, so he said, when you look at life, it has no reason, no meaning, and no choice. If you just look at life itself. I mean, be reasonable. We appear, 
We never asked for it. We live a life full of, full of constraints and sensory attachments and happiness and sadness and gain and loss and whatnot. What kind of meaning is there? And uh, it has no specific reason. It's just following a succession of karma. And basically you have no choice because once you were born, you definitely will die. So no reason, no meaning, no choice. But don't stop there. Don't fall into emptiness. Don't become a nihilist. When you attain your true self, big reason, big meaning, big choice appear. Now, if you look at this, that's complete. And when I heard that early enough as a layman, that was like oiling my heart. I felt so good because the West went only 50%. That's why Western intellects, the more they think about the meaning of life, the choices they have, the deeper they get into nihilism. And I didn't want to do that. I was too much happiness oriented. I wanted to feel good. I wanted to rejoice. And that's very healthy that people don't want to attach to depression and suffering and being nihilistic. It's great that we don't and cannot do that. So when you look at this, and that's a perfect motivation for practice, not losing your independence, not getting a shot of fanatical ideas and beliefs in your mind from the outside. It's a very clear motivation without an actual promise. If you practice and attain, big reason, big meaning, big choice appear. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Wonderful. More questions? I think you, as soon as you were born, you have a, a, a Christian background, right? Me? Yes. No. No? I have a diagnostic background. <laughs> <laughs> My parents are doctors. Uh, we were not religious. Uh, <laughs> uh, then, uh, if you read the Bible many times... No. I read it a few times. A few times. <laughs> Not many. <laughs> a few times. Uh, which chapter did you like to recommend for us uh, uh, to, in order to encourage our faith uh, as a Buddhist? Uh, I recommend not a chapter, but a word. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to read... If you want to read something really juicy from Jesus, then read the Gospel of Judas. These are the apocryph Gospels that I really recommend, because they were not edited by the various synods in the 3rd and 4th century. Uh, there were many synods where they were actually deciding what is canonical and what is apocryphal. And uh, to our great luck, in various uh, ways, in the last 50 years, we recovered many texts like the Nakh Hammadi scrolls, the Dead Sea scrolls, uh, that, uh, that were not subject to this because they were not in the Bible. But those texts were preserved in the desert in one way or another. Mostly they are fragmented, but the Gospel of Judas is pretty much there. And the Gospel of Judith and Thomas and Maria. Now, if you read that, and uh, these are authenticated by various independent groups of scholars, never recognized by the church itself, or any church for that matter. Now, that, that gets you a feeling. Who he was, what he thought, what kind of fantastic radiance he had, what an immense spiritual power he brought back from India and Ladakh and Tibet, wherever he was. Yeah, he was there for 17, 18 years, proven. If the German scientists could publish that, that's without a doubt. <laughs> you know, they are so meticulous. And that is not uh, subject to this controversy that there are texts that were used um, to build an empire instead of really opening the hearts of men. That's my problem. And not just my problem, anybody's problem who are yearning for the full teaching. And eventually, when you read those texts, it will motivate you, all these uh, Gnostic Gospels. When you read them, then uh, it will motivate you to practice even more. Because there you have a totally different view of the world, the heart of humans, our job on this planet. It will just totally melt you. Because you feel his true love, not what is used for manipulating people through various organizations as a phrase of forced conversion, but his true love and compassion, which he had. 
Otherwise, why would people follow him? There were so many prophets and prophets to be in his era. The age and that area was loaded with people who were in tattered and battered clothing, and they were talking about the wrath of God, you know, from various stands and pulpits and rostrums. Why was he so special? What made him so special? And it was not just the crucifixion and the resurrection after that, but the actual mind he carried, the actual message he gave. I wish that everybody who uses his name would truly understand who he was and what he brought here. We would have <clears throat> way less fanaticism, pain, and war on this planet if they truly understood him. Last question. Wan Guang Sa in Hungary, how are you doing? Thank you, we're fine. <laughs> We are close to the largest Catholic cathedral in the Carpathian Basin, meant as a second Vatican, the Vatican of the North. And if you go in there, you can see what 1100 years of established Catholicism can do. It can become very accommodating and much softer than the kind of harsh and fiery thing which has been here for a few decades. And. Uh, we are doing fine in our little valley. We just had our great Buddha hall beam raising ceremony, the Sanyang Shik, thanks to uh, the wonderful appearance of the Sudok Sapang Jang Sol Chong Kun Sunim and many other monks, including the Hwagya Sajuji Suam Sunim, Sudok Sa Chong Mu Jong Bom Sunim, uh, many Uyghurs from Italy, from Finland, from Serbia, and myself. And uh, students from Hungary, all together, we were more than 100. And we opened a new chapter in our, not just the Bulsa, the actual temple building, but in our own internal temple building as well. Most people believe that Bulsa is difficult. I agree to that, but not for the same reasons as they think. They think it's difficult to get money, to get support, to be networked, and I totally agree to that. But that's not the initial difficulty. The initial difficulty is ourselves. So can we build a temple inside? Can we have our heart open and clear and helping other people? So can we serve as refuge? Can we serve as someone who helps other people's awakening? In other words, have we built our internal temple sufficiently so that the external could appear? If that is the case, then it's just a matter of patient endurance and perseverance and correct effort so that the external would appear. In that sense, there is no sense of uh, kind of ambition or urgency or time lost. We are not in that realm, fortunately, when we have that clock ticking and we have to finish the temple by this and this date. No, we are rebuilding it inside and keeping it clear inside moment to moment. And the external appearance comes when it's time for it to come and it doesn't lessen our effort, it just makes our mind stronger. So the community itself is not that numerous. We have about six, seven residents. Uh, and uh, we have retreats that are totally donation-based. Even staying in the temple is donation-based. We do not have the fixed price, you know, temple stay, which is prevalent in Korean temples. And... Uh, and I think this is the way we, we want to keep it if we can. If this kind of morality and ethics uh, appeals to people, then we will always receive enough donations to, to get by and to expand if we can. And so far, our retreats never went below full house. Without immodesty, I can say that. So a year and a half ago, when our transition was finished and all the papers were signed, almost two years by now, we abolished the fixed quotas you don't see any figures like numbers next to our retreats, but we have a trilingual sign in Korean, English, and Hungarian that our temple is supported by donations only. Please help us so that we could help others. Now, people experience the actual activity and atmosphere in the temple, then there is not much thinking about it. 
I hope we can maintain this. But if necessary, we will work. We will produce more vegetables. If necessary, we'll trade those vegetables, not put them to the market, but trade those vegetables for things we need. And that's how we will work, we will work out. We have no intention to commercialize our activity at all. It's not just highly taxed, it's very dangerous as well, and we discredit ourselves. We will never do that. If necessary, we will personally work. That's good. It's very healthy, okay? But I hope we'll stay in the realm when our primary activity of meditation, uh, retreats, counseling, Zen interviews, uh, the helping hand towards the community, mostly in the in the realm of the mind and the heart that would generate enough sympathy and compassion so that we could sustain ourselves based on this kind of activity. But we are not shy of extending ourselves and exerting ourselves in other ways, non-commercial ways to make things happen, to get by and to, to live correctly and, and expand. And uh, last but not least, everybody is cordially welcome to visit. Uh, don't think of 8,200 kilometers. Think about just uh, 12 hours of air flight. Usually it's 10 plus 2. 지칸 비행기 없습니다. 미안합니다. So there is no direct flight, but you can transfer anywhere in Europe and get to us within the next, you know, one or two hours. And uh, you will be more than welcome. We'll be very happy to see you there. Practice together, go around and uh, have some tea together. After the Chomshim Konya. Yoruba, Sugashi Sumida, Kamsa Amida, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>